First of all, I bring you greetings from my dear friend, Joanne Moody, who I've been in conversation with. How many of you know Joanne? I think she's been here a few times. Amazing woman of God. I was at the Voice of the Apostles Conference that Global Awakening uh, puts on every year when she was healed uh, back in 2013. And uh, God has not stopped uh, launching out this amazing woman of God. Uh, so it's just an honor to be her friend and uh, to be at a place that welcomes her on a regular basis. Um, I want to say to you, um, I love being here in this area. God is doing a, a ripple effect of revival and glory that although you may not feel it, I feel it. And as an outsider, my opinion counts. Everybody smile. I just want to say when you're in it, you're not sure what's happening, but I'm telling you, I go into places that are pretty dark, pretty barren, not a lot happening, but something's happening here. Some of you are going to get excited about that. Something's happening here. And it's all good and it's all God. So I, once again, I want to thank the Rock of Roseville. I want to thank uh, Eric Waterbury and Firestarters. I want to thank Project Church for hosting myself and Kathy Fry for this conference. Uh, I believe, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself in a minute, but I have to start with this conviction. <clears throat> Dr. Diane Langberg, who is a uh, Christian psychologist out of Pittsburgh, who wrote the book Suffering in the Heart of God, which is a phenomenal book, but she makes this statement. She says that trauma is the 21st century mission field for the Church of Jesus Christ because there is no other organization on the planet that knows how to address trauma or has the tools that are necessary to address trauma that's happening in this world today. So I am convinced that God is calling the Church of Jesus Christ to no longer make trauma a taboo subject to talk about because it's too messy or it's too big of a giant. But instead, we are called because we have the power of the blood of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. There is no giant too great. There is no subject too messy. That the reality is that we have the power to put the spirit of trauma and Satan under our feet and bring freedom to everybody who wants it in Jesus' name. Could I have an agreement in the room, anybody? In my prayer for Rock of Rose. My prayer for Rock of Roseville is that you would become one of those hubs in this region where people could come and bring all of their PTSD, all of their trauma, all of the stuff that they've been going years to therapists. And by the way, I'm not against therapists. I'm not against counselors. I'm not against psychologists. But I'm telling you that the only thing that truly heals, the only medicine that brings healing to the shattered soul and the broken heart is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ applied through the Holy Spirit. My name is Mike, and it's great to be here. I have the privilege over, uh, first of all, um, I have an amazing wife. Her name is Roxanne. Uh, those of you that came to the conference met her. Uh, she and I have been married over 43 years, uh, which is amazing that she hasn't killed me yet. And that's, all, that's a whole other story. But we have three children and five grandchildren. I'm originally just a boy from Illinois. Any Illinois people that, come on, back there. I, good to see you. So I'm originally from Illinois, pastored for 35 years. And uh, then in uh, October of 2011, I finally went on a mission trip with my friend Randy Clark, who I had known as a fellow Baptist pastor going all the way back to 1983. I went on a Brazil trip and was asked during that Brazil trip if I wanted, if I would pray and ask the Lord if I was to come and direct the education programs for Global Awakening. Uh, at first, I said no because I was a really happy pastor. Everything was going great for me. But I heard the yes, the, the, the Lord saying, this is a yes of obedience. How many of you know the yes of obedience? Anybody? When it doesn't make sense, but you say yes anyway. So I said yes. And in the midst of that, uh, I, began, I moved to Pennsylvania. First time I'd ever been to Pennsylvania. We moved there, began directing the education programs, which included the College of Ministry and the, um, the Global School of Supernatural Ministry. 
And then because Randy Clark assigned me to pray for an Iraqi war veteran who was suffering from severe PTSD symptoms, uh, he had asked for prayer from Randy, and Randy assigned him to me. And because I had no clue what to do, everybody smile. How many of you know that God calls you to assignments that you have no clue what to do? But he never calls the qualified. He always qualifies the called. So when I asked the Holy Spirit what to do, he gave me steps how to pray for this man. And within about 10 minutes' time, the Lord completely healed him of his suicidal thoughts, his chronic nerve pain, his sleepless nights, his night terrors, his flashbacks, his anxiety, his depression. He got completely healed and restored in Jesus' name and now works full-time at a, at a retreat center that he founded for military and active-duty soldiers and veterans to get healed of PTSD. That started a journey over the last... 11 years that ended up founding a 501c3 called the God Heals PTSD Foundation. Everybody says, wow, that's a bold statement. Well, it's a true statement. God heals PTSD. And it's a foundation that while I've, I've worked full time for Global Awakening, uh, God has begun to open international doors. And in the last 11 years, I've been to nine different countries. I've been to 38 states in this in this country, and I've trained over 15,000 people in the healing prayer uh, trauma model that I trained at the conference. And we have over 25,000 verified testimonies of people who've been healed of all the symptoms of unhealed trauma and PTSD. Somebody give thanks to God, will you? They weren't people that I prayed for, they were people that I equipped. All of you that are at the conference, raise your hand. These are all part of my army of heart healers and chain breakers. And if you look at them, they will be more than happy. I'm, guys, get ready. Uh, they will be, raise your hand again. They'll be more than happy to pray for you. Everybody smile. They will. They'll pray for you because they're, they have been assigned to be part of this uh, army to raise up people and to break the power of trauma that has been assigned to this world in Jesus' name. So before I begin, I just want, want to pray um, real, quick, real quick so I get past it. I have a book in the back. It's called Supernatural Freedom from the Captivity of Trauma. It has the entire healing trauma seminar, and it has actually the prayer model in the appendix in the back that you can actually read through the prayer and get healed of trauma. There's also some prayer cards back there and some DVDs that are available that have the, the seminar on it. And I'll be back at the book table at the end of the service if you have any more questions. But as I pray for you, just keep your eyes open, if you would, please. That in the name of Jesus, under the authority of the pastors of this church, I take authority over every single assignment of the powers of darkness against any person in this room or that's listening by live stream or by recording in Jesus' name. I applied the blood of Jesus Christ to us, to our families, to everything that we love and hold dear in Jesus' name. I declare in Jesus' name that there is no demonic spirit that has any authority here. So I cancel the assignments, of the spirit of trauma, the spirit of torment, and the spirit of fear. I cancel the assignments of the spirit of addictions. I cancel the assignment of the spirit of suicide and death and murder in Jesus' name. And I also cancel the assignment of the spirit of depression, anxiety, and panic in Jesus' name. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would send your angels. There are angels already in this room, but Lord, send healing angels that will begin to touch people even as I speak today. And let the glory of God fall in this room today and bring transformation to break the power of trauma off of people's lives and set them free in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, there's really just a couple passages we're going to go to today. The first one is Psalm 23. The second one is Isaiah 61. So if you have a, a Bible or your Bible app, I'm going to invite you to go to it. By the way, is there a military veteran in this room that would like to have this book? Come on. Come on right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on. Come on. Here you go, sir. Hey. Thank you for your service. 
Thank you for laying down your life for our freedom. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you. Give it up for our veterans, will you? Give thanks to God for them. So how many of you know we live in a pretty traumatic world? As a matter of fact, doesn't it feel like the trauma is escalating in a significant way? Over the last year and a half, I've had the privilege of uh, going with a team from Agape Freedom Fighters to Rwanda uh, to minister under the auspices of the Catholic Church and teach them how to get free of the genocide that took place over 30 years ago that they're still living under the shadow of. And we have seen so much healing and transformation take place within the Catholic Church in Rwanda that we're going to go back uh, later on this fall and do more training among the evangelical and Pentecostal churches. I've had the privilege of going to Ukraine last March in the midst of a war, going to Kiev and going to Dnipro and ministering in churches where there is a huge harvest of souls that's coming into the church. By the way, Ukraine is seeing one of the largest harvest of souls, that is people coming into the kingdom, than any other country in this world right now. In the midst of war, the billion harvest of souls is happening. And in the midst of it, we're not only traveling there, but also doing Zoom calls with leaders. I've had the privilege of ministering through Zoom to missionaries in Myanmar, church planters who were being severely persecuted uh, because of their faith. I ministered to a apostolic church planter and her son who had literally been uh, captured, put into prison, tortured. To be, she, she is an apostle over 35,000 church house churches in Myanmar, in Burma, and she was tortured to give up the names of the pastors of those churches. She refused to do so, so they brought in her son and tortured him in her presence. And he refused, he was her assistant, he refused to give up the names. Uh, they were in a very hopeless place, expecting to be executed, and then somebody left a prison door open. So they escaped and, and got to a safe house in India. But how many of you know they still carry trauma from what they experienced? They said flashbacks, sleepless nights. They had chronic nerve pain. They, they had anxiety. They had fear. And through a Zoom call, God just sent them free. And now we're teaching that, uh, that version of the trauma prayer to all the church planners so that they can bring healing to the persecuted Christians in Myanmar. Uh, when October 7th happened uh, in Israel, I uh, was contacted by a leader of the largest Messianic Jewish network in Israel, and we've been in Zoom calls uh, training the pastors and counselors and chaplains how to bring healing to trauma to the people in Israel, to those that were actually in the attack, those young people that were in the concert where so many young people were either captured or killed, and were actually in the process right now of setting up a trauma healing center in the city of Jerusalem where people can come and receive trauma prayer for, the, for what's happened during the war. So I want to tell you guys, God is on the move. But when we talk about revival, we talk about renewal, we talk about the glory of God, those are some of my favorite subjects. But let me say this to you. God is concerned about your soul and about your heart. And even though, you know, how many of you know, you can be in one of the most glorious revival, renewal, awakening meetings and still walk out bleeding and wounded. The presence of God does bring some healing, but sometimes we have to go after some things in our lives, particularly the hidden wounds that we're afraid to tell anybody else about. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? You see, many times... We, we have this thing that we come into church and we say, well, how are you today? Well, I'm fine. How many of you know that's men, particularly men, that's, that's, our, that's our answer. I'm fine. I'm fine. Which says, leave me alone. I don't want anybody to touch me. I'm hurting, but just leave me alone, you know. I want to say this to you, that I believe a church like the Rock of Roseville, I, I can feel the family atmosphere in this place. And when you have real 
solid, healthy, loving family, every person's soul matters. Every bleeding, broken soul matters. And if Jesus loves your soul enough to shed his blood so that you can go and spend eternity with him, he also loves your soul enough that he wants you to live in wholeness and freedom here and now. In Psalm chapter 23, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. What's the next thing? He restores my soul. Now this is significant for David because as many at the conference learned, I believe that David is one of the most traumatized men in the whole Bible. I believe between rejection from his family, uh, being as a 15-year-old boy put in a situation when he had to go to war and chop off a giant's head and begin to kill thousands of people, which, by the way, we champion our, our military veterans, our active duty soldiers, but the reality is by being on the battlefield, they end up with hidden wounds that nobody wants to talk about. But the reality is many of those wounds and those memories stay with them for the rest of their lives, except for the intervention of the Holy Spirit and bringing healing to them. So David experienced trauma by being persecuted for 13 years by Saul, and he knew what it was to have people come against him and try to kill him. Saul, the, the, the king that he served, tried to kill him twice. So David knew what it was to have trauma. And for those of you that are not at the conference, I want to give you a real quick definition of what trauma is. You see, when we talk about trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder in our culture, we see this this huge, complicated thing. We see it as something that if you have that, you're afraid to tell anybody about it. And then when you tell people about it, you get labeled as somebody who maybe has a mental disorder or some kind of mental illness that it's a label, particularly in the military and the first responder community, it's a label that sticks with you for the rest of your career and can actually put a black mark on your career record. And, and we're afraid to talk about it because we don't want people to know how wounded we really are. And at the same point, we've, we've heard all of these stories about people who've been dealing with their trauma for years in therapy, in counseling, in going from psychiatrist to psychologist to counselor to prayer ministry trying to deal with their trauma. Well, guys, um, there's a lady in here, one of the intercessors, who has something wrong with her with her arm. She broke it or has a shoulder. Yeah, right there. And the Lord is healing your, is it your shoulder or your arm? Your shoulder. The Lord is healing your shoulder in Jesus' name. But you're not dealing with it by not paying attention to it. You actually did the right thing in that you got some treatment for it. You're wearing a sling to help you support it for the time as you walk through it. And there's going to be complete restoration for your shoulder by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, trauma is not a mental illness. It's not a mental disorder. This lady experienced trauma in her shoulder. How many of you understand what I just said? She had trauma in her shoulder because trauma, the root word for trauma is wound. So when you carry unhealed trauma or when you've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, it's not that all of a sudden you have a disorder or a mental illness. You're wounded because the root word of trauma is wound. As a matter of fact, there's one time that the word trauma shows up in the New Testament, and it's in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus tells the story about the man who was beaten and robbed and left for dead on the side of the road, literally stripped naked and left for dead. And religious people came by and didn't pay any attention to him. But the Samaritan, who was despised by the Jews, came, and it says that he saw that the man was traumatizo, 
or he was traumatized, he was wounded. And he took the man and he treated his traumas or his wounds. So everybody, if you have trauma in your life, you've been wounded. And you've been wounded in the one place that is one of the most central places in your entire being, and that is your soul. So when David makes the declaration, he restores my soul, I, I read lots of different paraphrases, and they say, you know, he refreshes my soul, or like, you know, God takes me to the spa, and I get a manicure, a pedicure, and a, and a facial type of a thing. That's not what that word refers to. It is the word restoration that is about being restored, not only back to the way that you originally were, but actually be restored better than you've ever known in your entire life. That the reality is, is that God, how God does restoration is not like the world does restoration. You know, you, you see these ads for restoration companies that when there's been a flood or a fire, they come in and they try to put the house back together the way it was and try to make it as good as it was before the damage that happened. But I'm telling you, God's method of restoration is restoring you back to his original dream and design for your life, something that you may have never experienced because as a child you were born in to a broken and evil and a difficult world by which many of us experienced trauma when we were a child. So we've never known what it is to live in a safe place. We've never known what it is not to live wounded. We never known what it is to feel like that we're whole beings because of all the trauma, of all the pain, of all the evil that's been done to us. And in the midst of it, because we're in pain, we've made lots of bad choices that have caused us even more trauma. So we feel like we're in this whirlwind of trauma that we'll never get out of because that's what the enemy wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that trauma is simply a part of who you are. You're just going to have to suck up and live with it for the rest of your days. And I'm saying to you, that is not, God, that is not God's purpose for you. To be restored is to finally know the fullness of the dream of God for your life. And my friends, I see, I see a wonderful mixture of ages here. And it doesn't make any difference how, how old you are. The dream of God is still available for you. The greatest days of living with Jesus are still ahead for you. If you will allow him to tear down the wall that trauma has built around your soul and bring healing and freedom in Jesus' name. Turn with me to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 is really the, the theme of the conference that I do. It's the theme of the ministry that I do in training and equipping people to bring healing to trauma. It's significant because it is the prophecy of the ministry of Jesus. And as we read this prophecy again, we begin to see Jesus' care for the human soul. Jesus' care for the plight of humanity. See, there's one thing you need to understand why Jesus came. Everybody, before you read, everybody look at me. Everybody smile. Jesus did not come to change God's mind about humanity. He came to change humanity's mind about God. I'll say it again just so you get it. Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about humanity. He came to change humanity's mind about God. You see, for too many centuries, we have lived with a view of God that God is up there, and we're down here. And while he loves us and he cares for us, we wonder if he really ever does pay attention to us because it feels like that our prayers don't get answered. We feel like that we have a ceiling over us, that our prayers get bounce off the ceiling. And we wonder, does God really care for me? Does he care for my plight? Now, how many of you know that David prayed that prayer? How many of you read the Psalms lately? Anybody? 
How many of you know, you, as you read the Psalms, you can get every single em human emotion out of the Psalms? As a matter of fact, Bill Johnson from Bethel says, if you don't know what to pray, start reading the Psalms till you find your voice. David expresses anger, rage, frustration, depression, suicidal tendencies. He expresses joy. He expresses peace. He expresses happiness. He expresses rage. He expresses murderous rage. How many of you read the Psalms where he says, God, kill my enemies, cut out their tongues, stab them in the heart with a spear? You know, like you and I on a typical day, right? You know, I mean, he expresses all these emotions. And the testimony of him, watch this, in the New Testament, that he was a man after God's own heart. Because he knew God saw him. He knew God was not ashamed of him. He knew God refused to let David get beyond the shelter of his care, that even in the midst of his trauma, God saw, God loved him, God delivered him over and over again. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 34, which is an amazing psalm to read today when you go home, read the entire psalm, but in Psalm 34, 17, David writes this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I know you don't have that on your refrigerator as a verse, do you? <laughs> but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Then 34.18 says, God is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you've ever known what it is to carry unhealed trauma in your life, you know what it feels like to be crushed by it. You know what it is to carry a weight that's so heavy that sometimes you wonder if you can bear up underneath it. And see the term brokenhearted in the Bible, in the Hebrew, literally means to have a shattered soul. That's what brokenhearted means. For those of us that grew up with songs about being, you know, breaking up with our girlfriends or our boyfriends, and that broke our heart. Guys, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the things that happen to us in life and the things that we do out of that pain that cause our souls to be shattered by the things that have happened to us and the things that we've done. You see, your soul is the seat of everything that you are, and it's that which Jesus comes to save. Go to the next slide, if you would, please. And in your soul, there are four components that it's important that you understand what those components are. The first one is your mind, what and how you think. Your memories, the images that you carry of both good and bad things. But how many of you know that your mind can literally be rewired by the trauma that you've experienced in your life? that your memory can be affected by all the traumatic things that you've experienced and seen. And sometimes the only thing that you can remember are the bad things, and it's difficult for you to remember the good things of your life. You can begin to have neural pathways build up in your brain that are full of not only the traumatic events that happened to you, but the lies that come with them. You see, my friend, there is a spirit of trauma, a demonic spirit, that when a traumatic event happens to you, it uses that traumatic event as a landing strip. And here's what it'll do. It'll come and first tell you that the reason why this trauma happened to you is because of who you are. It'll deliver shame to you and say to you, that the reason why this happened to you is because ultimately, deep in the core of your being, you are bad. And only bad things happen to bad people. The second thing that this spirit of trauma will do is bring guilt to you in the midst of that trauma. How many of you know that many people who are survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse carry the weight of what the enemy has lied to them and they think that they have been told that they're responsible for the horrific assault that took place upon them that's guilt 
And what it says is, you must have done something bad. That's why God is punishing you. And you're told by your abusers and even by this world, well, you know, you just need to get over it. There's, you know, you obviously welcomed it in some way. And I want to say to you in Jesus' name, that's one of the greatest, most damaging lies done to anybody who's ever known sexual abuse or assault. <laughs> Pastors, when you think, and by the way, I know you guys go after this stuff, so this is not in, in any way, shape, or form uh, about you guys, but when you think that one in three women have known some kind of sexual violation by the time they turn 15, and one in five men have known sexual violation by the time they turn 15. You understand that sexual violation and abuse is a huge giant that we refuse to address in the church because we don't know what to do with it. Well, I want to tell you, Jesus knows what to do with it. He knows how to tear down those lies and bring healing and to let you know that you, do not, uh, you don't need to let any traumatic event that's happened to you define you by your identity, by who you are. Could I have an agreement in the room, anybody? Number two, your will, what and how you choose, is, a, is in your soul. So trauma affects that in this way. How many of you know of people who've had a really traumatic life and because they have so much pain attached to that, they begin to use things and do things that all of a sudden become an addiction. They use drugs, they use alcohol, they use sex, they use gambling, they use pornography, they use work, they use all sorts of things, they use sports as something to get away from their pain. And then unfortunately, both we in the church and the culture, we point our fingers at addicts and say, clean up, change your habits, get over it. When the reality is that the only thing that they've found so far to get rid of their pain is that which they've chased after, which unfortunately brings more bondage, brings more destruction, brings more trauma. And you need to understand that people who have been traumatized make bad choices. All you have to do is go read the story of David. He sexually assaulted Bathsheba. He deliberately disobeyed God by taking a census of the people of Israel that brought a plague. He didn't take care of his own children very well that ended up having rape and murder within his own family. David knew what it was to make some really bad choices that he experienced even more trauma for. So understand that many times the bad choices, and, and by the way, I'm not saying don't take responsibility for your choices, but what I'm saying is understand the root of why we make bad choices. How many of you understand what I just said? Would you wave a hand at me? Number three, your emotions. Trauma affects your emotions in such a way either, number one, you have mostly negative emotions that are full of depression, panic, anxiety, worry, fear, hatred, self-hatred, or you don't feel anything at all. You feel so numb that the only thing, you just don't feel anything, and maybe the only emotion that you feel is anger and rage. If you're a person that rages, I can pretty much guarantee you're carrying unhealed trauma. If you're a person that people have to walk on eggshells around, my brother, my sister, your soul needs to be healed of the trauma that you experienced in Jesus' name. And finally, your identity, who you are. What defines you? You see, your culture, the American culture, tells you that what defines you is all of your experiences. You know, when I was getting ready to go to college in the early 70s, that will age me right now, in the early 70s, my parents were told, send your kid to college so he'll find out what his identity is. How many of you know that was a mistake? I was in the midst of a cultural revolution where people were turning to every kind of substance that they could to put in their bodies to try to trip out and get out of reality a sexual revolution where it was said, it's free sex and free love, just 
Have as much sex as you possibly can and don't worry about the consequences. And, the, and we were turning literally against ourselves and bringing destruction against ourselves and nobody knew who they were. Trauma affects your identity in such a way that you learn, you learn to be defined by what has happened to you and what you've done. You actually, particularly, and I know these pastors have seen this, I'll meet somebody and I'll, I'll meet them and I'll begin talking with them and I'll say, well, tell me about yourself. What's your, what's your story? And if immediately they go into all of the trauma that's happened to them, then I know that they've listened to the lie that the very fact that they've been traumatized is the most significant thing about them. And they've learned, particularly in church, everybody, that the best way to get attention is to let everybody know what a victim I am. Is to let everybody know how much trauma I have. And that's the way I get attention. And my friend, what that does, it, it only concretes even more the identity of you being a victim, being a person who has been traumatized, and it becomes something that you can't see anything good in your life except all of the trauma. And I want to say to you, Jesus came, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. I no longer have to be identified by that. Yeah, you can give thanks to God for that. So therefore, we can say with confidence that I am no longer defined by my trauma. I'm no longer defined by what I have done, my sin, iniquity, and transgression. I'm no longer defined by what has happened to me. I'm no longer defined by my family, and I'm no longer defined by what I've witnessed. But instead, my definition doesn't come from anything else in my life except the experience of the love of the Father who came and met me in the person of Jesus Christ. And I came to know him not as a judgmental, angry God, but I came to know him as a loving Father who showed me the fullness of the revelation of who we are, who he is in the loving person of Jesus Christ. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. I want to show you a quick video. This is, we did a, a conference out in uh, Andrew Womack's facility in uh, Colorado. And a man who had some severe PTSD came running up to me. I hadn't even had a chance to speak yet. And he came running up to me. And uh, he, really, uh, he really needed prayer for something that had happened five years before with his son and how he was still carrying that. So, Michael, could we show that video right now, please? Uh, my healing is not something you can see physically, but I have been diagnosed with PTSD, and I've had it for five years and three months. And I, uh, I almost lost my son when he was one and a half years old, and those traumatic images stuck with me. And every time he had a, a sneeze or a cough, I would check his forehead. My sleep became shallow. I didn't sleep good for five years. I was hypersensitive. I hated who I have become. I did not love myself. And I came to this conference this week. Now, the healing happened Wednesday, but I'm still living the healing now. Um, I got a revelation that God loved me even when I hated myself. And, and that he, he was faithful to me when I wasn't faithful to him. Well, I went to my catchings because I went to a bookstore. I didn't know him a month and a half ago. I said, do you have any books on PTSD? I said, we only have one. I said, I'll take it. I don't care who it's by. And I read it, and I was depressed that day. And it changed me that day. And I said, I got to keep reading. Two weeks later, I heard he was coming here. And I said, this is not a coincidence. God set me up. I, Amen. I fought this for five years and three months. In that time, I laughed. I laughed <laughs> like four times. <laughs> I haven't laughed more than four times in five years. <laughs> I went up to Mike Hutchings and I said, hey, I want you to be my point of contact. I went to his website. I listened to his blogs. I listened to the testimonies of the vets that got healed because I thought PTSD was incurable. I thought this was a new me. 
I thought I was scarred. I was mad. I was angry. I was going to have to deal with it. I saw the testimonies. Then I saw his teachings. So I got my expectations up. And I said, Wednesday's the night. I told my wife, I tried Christian counseling. I, I couldn't sleep for five years. Wednesday's going to be my night. My coach is going to be there. I know God's going to go through him. And I'm going to cross the finish line. I'm going to be done. 100% done. And I came up here, and he laid his head on the right side of my head. And I felt heat going through the right side of my brain. Now, I'm not a psychologist, and I don't know where the memories are stored, but I'm pretty sure maybe that was it. <laughs> but I felt heat because those memories just got burned up. And that heat came, and I felt the heat going through my ear and to the back of my head. And I fell down on the floor. And I stayed there, and it was like I had a warm pillow. And I just left, I just, I just, I was laying on it. And I said, Holy Spirit, I don't want to leave. They got to close, but I don't want to leave. And he told me so gently, because my emotions, when you have PTSD, they yell at you so loudly. And you forget how small of a still voice his voice is. And he told me, you're taking me with you. I never leave you, nor forsake you. And I went home, and I slept, because when you have PTSD, you sleep, but you don't sleep. Like I said, any, any slightest noise, I would get up in a panic, my heart racing. So I would be sleep deprived. I would be so tired, I'd go to bed like at seven or eight. And I thought it was just old age, I'm only 37. <laughs> I would kid around like that, but, but it was serious. And the last three nights, the last three nights, I have slept so soundly and so deep. So I am still feeling the healing today. I'm not 80%, I'm 100%. I can laugh, I can sleep, I can Amen. laugh, I can sleep. Yep. Mike, you can go ahead and it's shut that down. <laughs> Thank you. Go to the next slide. If you can, please, next slide, next slide. Pastor Ken, I love the fact, you go to the next slide, please. Um, Pastor Ken, I love the fact that you referenced Jesus scourging because it says in Isaiah 53, 5, that we are healed by the scourging that Jesus received. Because Jesus' body and soul suffered trauma on our behalf so that our trauma can be healed. In Japanese art culture, they have this thing called kintsugi or kintsukuroi. And when a pe beautiful piece of art pottery is broken, instead of picking up the pieces and throwing them away, they take those pieces and they use gold or silver lacquer to put the pieces back together again so that the original dream and design of the creator is restored and is more beautiful and more valuable so that the original dream has the gold in it and restored to even a greater beauty. Last slide, please. This is what he wants to do with your shattered soul and your broken heart. He wants to bring the gold of heaven in. He wants to help you to know that you're no longer defined by what's happened to you or what you've done. You're defined by who your Father calls you. So I'm going to pray for you right now. And I know at the end there will be a prayer team at the front to pray for you as well. But here's the deal. If I'm going to pray for you, even corporately, I want you to look at me. I want you to keep your eyes open. My, all of my conference guys all know this already. They know this drill. By the way, those of you at the conference, how many of you have experienced better sleep than you have in a long time? Look at that, guys. So this is available for you, too, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for the presence of Holy Spirit in this room right now. I thank you, Father, that for everybody, both here in this room as well as online, who loves Jesus, that you are completely forgiven of all of your sin that there is nothing between you and Father God, that there is no distance between you and him, that he loves you with an everlasting love. I want you to make this positive declaration to somebody next to you. Say, I am completely forgiven of everything. And then say to that same person, you are completely forgiven of everything. And so as we continue in this prayer, as the Holy Spirit begins to show you people that you need to forgive, that you'll just say, Lord, I forgive them, I release them in Jesus' name because the thing that keeps you attached to the trauma they brought into your life is unforgiveness. 
And so through the day, as the Holy Spirit will bring those people up to your mind, just say, Father, I forgive them. I release them in Jesus' name. Say that with me. Father, I forgive them. I release them in Jesus' name. Now take your right hand and put it right here. Now I'm going to pray for you. Keep your eyes on me. In Jesus' name, I speak to your shattered soul. I speak to the wounds in your soul that have come through trauma, that what others have done to you, what you've witnessed, and what you've done yourself. And in Jesus' name, I declare the shalom of God, not only peace, but wholeness upon your soul. I plead the blood of Jesus to bring healing to every wound, every dart, spear, and arrow come out of your soul. And in Jesus' name, let the pieces come back together again in the name of Jesus. Because if that's happening with you, you're going to begin to feel a warmth. And you don't have to feel it, but many of you begin to feel a warmth in your hand. That's the power of the Holy Spirit confirming for you that he's doing a work. And because the demons that have been lying to you no longer have any hold on you because Jesus is healing those wounds, I cancel and I sever every assignment of the spirit of trauma, every assignment of the spirit of fear, every assignment of the spirit of torment, every assignment of the spirit of suicide, every assignment of the spirit of death and murder in Jesus' name. I cancel this assignment against you. And I specifically speak to my brothers and sisters who were known what it was to be sexually abused and assaulted. And in Jesus' name, I sever the connection between you and your abuser in Jesus' name that you are no longer attached to that and there are no longer any more chains on you. But you are free. You are free. You are free. And every demonic thing that came against you through your abuser, we close the door of access so that you be free in Jesus' name. Now take your right hand and put it right back here on your head. And in the name of Jesus, this is where all of your traumatic images and memories are stored. And in Jesus' name, I command... Every traumatic image and memory dry up and die right now in Jesus' name. I command the neural pathway that leads to them to be severed, and I command your five senses to no longer be triggers to those traumatic images and memories. I command your mind and your memory to be free of the trauma that's captivated it, and that you begin to have your memory restored to you, including your short-term memory, in Jesus' name. I also declare that you begin, beginning tonight, to have six to eight hours of sweet sleep, according to Proverbs 3.24, that says, because you walk in covenant with God, you shall no longer lie down in fear, but it's your father's inheritance to his children to give them sweet sleep. So say this with me, in Jesus' name, sweet sleep is my inheritance that I receive now, in Jesus' name. Now take your hand and put it right back here again and pray this. I'm going to lead it. You pray with me. Holy Spirit, come and fill every air of my life that has been occupied by trauma. I reject trauma. I ask for complete healing. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and fill me with your love, your joy, your peace, and your power. In the name of Jesus. I declare I am no longer defined by my history, what I have done, what's been done to me, what, by my family, or what I've witnessed. I am defined by who my Father calls me. My Heavenly Father calls me His beloved child, in whom He is well pleased. Therefore, I am loved, I'm accepted. I'm forgiven, I am filled with His Spirit, I'm kept with His love, I have a great destination ahead of me, that's heaven, but in the meantime, I'm going to bring heaven to earth through the love and the joy that I carry of the Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, give thanks to God, would you everybody? Pastor.